Welcome to everyone. I'm David Gibson, the director of Fordham University's Center on Religion and Culture, and the host of uh, this webinar today, Saving Creation, the Pope, the Pandemic, and Laudato Si at Five, a discussion of Pope Francis's uh, landmark encyclical on, on the environment, on climate change, but also on much more, something I think that gets often gets lost in the discussion. It was published five years ago uh, this month to much acclaim, uh, but also some pointed criticism. And to discuss the encyclical and consider where we are on these issues at this critical juncture in history now, five years later, we are very fortunate to be joined by two of my colleagues at Fordham and two Vatican officials in Rome who are all, all experts in various aspects of the issues raised in Laudato Si. So we have Team Vatican and we have Team Fordham. This is not a competition. It's not a debate. <laughs> we, we, we are all going to be very, these are all great experts who are going to be able to inform us on the various aspects of truly what is such a critical issue. Brief introduction. We have Father uh, Bruno Marie uh, Dufay, who's, well, in my view, he's just below me there. He's secretary or basically second in command of the Vatican's Department on Promoting Integral Human Development. Kind of a mouthful, it's the Vatican Department on Justice and Peace Issues and, and much more. Uh, and they're leading the efforts to promote the awareness, understanding and implementation of Laudato Si. We also have Father Augusto Zampini Davis, the adjunct secretary for the Vatican's Department on uh, Integral Human Development. Um, he also heads Pope Francis's new COVID-19 pandemic task force. And my colleagues at Fordham, we have Christiana Zenner, a professor of theology, science, and ethics, and author of a wonderful book, Just Water, Theology, Ethics, and mm -hmm. the Global Freshwater Crises. We also have Leo Guardado, another professor of systematic theology at Fordham, um, he focuses on issues of migration, peace, and justice, and he's a fellow, uh, a fellow birder like myself. He lives up in northern uh, Manhattan where he, he enjoys the, the great um, the beauties of nature with the uh, migration, the bird migration twice a year. So he's very fortunate, and we're very fortunate to have all of you here to discuss this. Um, and also a note to our live audience, you can submit questions in the sidebar using the chat function. Our assistant director, who is the man behind the screen you don't see, David Goodwin, will collect them all and we'll submit as many as we can to our panelists during this discussion. Now, listen, I want to um, start out with a question to all of you. Um, five years after this, this, this encyclical really sounded the alarm on these, <laughs> The, uh, the, the sins against the earth, as, as, as Pope Francis has called them, and where we were, um, things only seem to have gotten worse. We have the Arctic Circle registering record heat, Amazon deforestation continuing. Um, five years later, how critical is the situation with climate change and the health of the earth? Has anything improved? Or are we worse off than ever? Maybe let's start with you, Father Dufay. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning or good afternoon <laughs> to everybody. Uh, do you do you hear me? That, yes. That's okay. Oh, yes, okay. we can hear you, you well. Thank yep. You. Just to to uh, propose some introducing uh, reflection uh, from uh, uh, my uh, uh, point of view. Uh, with uh, my uh, reference, my experience in philosophy and uh, especially in uh, ethics in uh, the Catholic uh, University in Lyon in France. You, I, I imagine you are, you are re recognizing my French accent. So uh, <laughs> from this experience and from this reflection, I would like to, uh, to uh, propose that uh, we used to enter in the reflection of the Laudato Sinciclica with this uh, uh, call uh, from the Pope Francis, we, we have to listen to the cry from the earth and the cry from the poor. And uh, I think that it could be the, the, the good, the best way 
to uh, uh, consider the, the context of the fifth anniversary of this encyclica. Um, actually, uh, we, 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 we just have a, a very special experience of a new vulnerability of uh, not only physical vulnerability, but also the vulnerability of our uh, model of development and our model to take care of life and to take care of people. So this uh, uh, call to, to listen to the poor and to listen to the earth uh, could be a good introduction, a good uh, way uh, to uh, reflect about uh, this uh, vulnerability, this fragility, and also the connection, the very connection between all the crises we, we have to consider and to interpret in order to find, under the, in order to support courageous political and economical decisions today. So uh, I, I would like to, to propose to, to reflect uh, about this link between the fragility of the earth and the suffering, the experience of suffering of many people uh, more and more. And I would like to, uh, to think in this, in this instant, in this moment, to uh, the situation in uh, uh, South America, uh, in Brazil, in Amazonia, but also in Peru, um, and in other, uh, other uh, countries in Africa, for example. We realize that this fragility uh, touched the, 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 the question of our model of growing and what the, the encyclica uh, calls the, the technological paradigm or technological, uh, technocratical uh, model of development. Uh, because we, this, this experience of vulnerability or fragility is an experience to be exhausted. And th th this, this question to be exhausted to exhaust the, the, the resource, the natural resources, natural, but only, uh, but not only, and, but also human resources. This question is really in the in the heart, in the in the in the in the, the very uh, question of uh, the model model paradigm. Paradigm is not only the model. Paradigm is uh, the way to build a model, uh, but paradigm or model of development today. So the question for me is to introduce the, 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 the thema, the, 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 the argument of limit, how it's possible to uh, uh, experiment this limit and to put limit in our development, in our model, in our way of life also, to propose another paradigm and the text of the encyclica suggests that we could imagine, we could build another paradigm, but another cultural paradigm, say, say, say the text. Uh, so how can it could be possible to build this new paradigm today uh, with the memory of our experience, the memory of local communities, the memory of our cultures in Amazonia, in Cuenca of Congo, in uh, all over the world, in the local communities, and uh, how it's possible to uh, decide and to invest, to protect, and not only to produce, to protect and to produce. That the two chapters of the, the, the book of Genesis, the first uh, uh, chapter proposed to produce, to procreate, to participate to the creation, to go on creating. But the second, second chapter, as you know, uh, 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 calls us to uh, protect, protect and produce. And it's clear that this experience of pandemics uh, put on the first line uh, again the protection. And now we have to, to link to protect and to produce. It's the very moment, I think, of decision, and not only to, to have an intention, intention to protect, intention to, uh, to have an a, a ecological, integral ecological way. 
what does it mean? To decide is to take care, to elaborate plan for a new green and safe development and to share with uh, poor people and with communities. These two the three verbs, to take care, to plan, to share, I think are just like the three uh, a theological virtue, because to take care is to love, to elaborate plan or to plan is to hope, and to share is to, 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 to have a common, a common good and a common way. Faith, hope, and love. And these three verbs, care, think, uh, share, are like a fundamental trilogy, I think. So I don't want to, 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 to speak too, too, too long, but I think that uh, um, we, 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 need, we need to uh, uh, propose uh, a fundamental reflection about uh, our human condition about the, the link, the, 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 the relation between past and future, and uh, also the uh, question uh, of what we need, what, what, what do we need, what do we need? The, the, the question of need, this, the meaning of need, it's another question, very important question, to uh, uh, clarify what we hope and what we uh, uh, we are waiting for. This, we, we, we have to say that in the same word, in the same time, people uh, need something to, 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 to eat and other uh, people uh, have um, artificial needs. What do we need? What, what, what are the, 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 the most fundamental needs uh, uh, in, in our humanity? And how is possible to share? Because I, I think that future is share, to share, to share our capacity and capabilities, as said Amatia Sen, because poor people have many capabilities and many capacities, how to share our talents and how to, to open a new way uh, with uh, this hope of uh, more human uh, community. That, that's the, uh, the, the reflection I would like to, to, to propose to you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Father Dupay, very much. That's, that's beautiful. Uh, Leo Guardado, um, I mean, he spoke, uh, very, you know, Father Dupay uh, spoke about this new vulnerability, the fragility of the earth. Again, there's, so, there's this, confluence of crises, the pandemic, the environmental, climate change, all of these things. Do you really sense, I mean, you're from Salvador, you're a refugee, came here to the United States as a child. Um, so much of your work focuses on, on issues of migration. Do you see, I mean, do you see us at this point in time as aware of a common fragility? Is there any kind of a awakening or awareness, or is there more of a retreating into our own defensive postures? It all depends. Go ahead. It all depends on who the us is. Um, certainly, there is no one universal us here to, um, to speak from. So I would like to maybe emphasize my points from the perspective of uh, Latin America and environmental activists. Um, what has changed since then, or what has been the impact of Adopt to See, let's say, for those who experience those vulnerabilities on a daily basis? In Latin America, we have the highest concentration of environmental activists being killed around the world. Philippines is a lot last year, but there were over 200 in 2000, uh, 2017. So the most famous probably Berta Cáceres in Honduras. Uh, we see there the crystallization of what uh, Pablo de Fe is, you know, and what the document calls oh, the technocratic paradigm, this sickness and modernity, this logic that lives off of the commodification, the objectivization, the dehumanization of the other, the poor um, and the environment. In this case, all of us we've said is intricately connected. So, um, what difference has it made or um, is, it, is the movement going? I would say certainly at the local grassroots level, Laudato Si 
is a, a text of salvation. It is a salvific text for communities that can turn to an authority figure like the Pope, um, if they are a Catholic or even if they're not Catholic, to a religious institution um, like the church for support, for legitimization, uh, before forces that say, well, you're just, uh, you know, you, you don't know what you're talking about. We will build the dam for you. We will build a hydroelectric company for you and your life will be better. And the indigenous community said, well, no, actually, um, as Berta says, the river tells me, the river cries out to me, the river speaks to me. I listen to the waters. And, you know, as people in El Salvador speak of water there, with the water cries, it's dead water. So there's this, there's this wisdom that Laudato Si talks about also, I believe it's in paragraph 63, where it says no wisdom can be left out if we're going to address this crisis. So it's, yes, it's a, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a crisis of the environment, but I think it's more particularly, we hear the cry of the earth through the cry of those people being killed. And it's a very literal cry in the global south, I would say. There, Laudato Si continues to just, I think, um, uh, become palpable or become to, uh, has a way of saturating the local parishes in the mountains, for example. Um, the rains in El Salvador just took place uh, a few weeks ago. People killed, uh, roads completely done away with, infrastructure damaged. Um, there were villagers climbing up to parts of my department of Chalatenango to drop off um, food supplies, um, but also couching the or, or framing their work through the lens of we're living through the suffering because of the environmental crisis. And part of that is understood at the local level because of Laudato Si. So all that to say, I think in the global south, uh, this has given great hope and great energy. Um, I would be less uh, hopeful perhaps of the impact that's taking place on maybe would say Europe, United States, where that technocratic logic um, is deeply, deeply embedded in our everyday. Cristiano, what do you see, again, here in the, in the United States in particular, in terms of the recognition of that, that vulnerability that Father Dufay talked about and, and what Leo was talking about, you know, on the ground, it, and it does seem to me in what I've read and what I've seen, heard, on the ground in so many other areas, <laughs> there's a recognition that this is, as, as Leo put a salvific text, this is about our existential crisis. Um, do we have that? Do we have that awareness or recognition here? Why not? I echo the comments by Father Dufay and also by my esteemed colleague Leo because one of the tricky things about a papal document is that it is speaking, of course, to the entire planet in the language of Pope Francis and Laudato Si, and yet has to land in particular contexts. And famously, the United States, with our presumptive whiteness, our presumptive technocratic privilege, our presumptive addiction to various facets of modernity, such as consumerism and short-term thinking and private property, uh, led to a skepticism of the encyclical even before it was released in 2015 in the United States. But as Leo has pointed out, that's a very United States white-centric way of looking at things. And I think that in a time such as we are in right now, 2020, with massive ongoing environmental racism, uh, various issues on climate change that may be debated in the halls of Congress, but are not issues, are not seen as debates for younger generations. And of course, with Black Lives Matter and the connections among policing, various forms of violence, and concerns about human rights, not only to life, but to the substrates of life, like water. I think that there is an increasing recognition of the salience of a document such as this. Of course, <laughs> there's a lot of room for progress and improvement. And, um, you know, I, I was thinking in advance of our conversation today about not just what has changed in terms of United States Catholic reception of the document, but what has changed in terms of the Pope's message and the many efforts by the Vatican to expand and elaborate on that message. And four areas came to mind. I, of course, work on fresh water primarily, so a continued elaboration on fresh water is the first one. And the way that this is an example par excellence of the interconnections among social and environmental and economic forms of justice. Um, 
another is this idea that you actually brought up at the at the start, David, which is the idea of ecological sin. That's not really a language that is in Laudato Si. It is arguably there in terms of structural sin and concerns about economies of exclusion. But the Pope and the Amazon Synod and the Carita Amazonia, the apostolic exhortation by Pope Francis this February, really doubles down on the language of ecological sin in a way that I think is very profound for the Catholic Church and for environmental thinking more generally. So that's number two, one water, two ecological sin. Um, three are questions of the economy. And I remember when Pope Francis was elected, there was much skepticism about his stance on the economy. Was he going to be anti-capitalist in ways that violated a vaunted American identity? And the fact of the matter is that the Pope is neither anti-capitalist nor anti-socialist. He is looking for economies that conduce to flourishing and to integral human development. And so framing the question as a question of what human goods, what kinds of capabilities do economies facilitate is, I think, increasingly recognized here in the United States in our current moment. Um, and then finally, the issue of corruption. Also in the Amazon Synod, also in Carita Amazonia, also in documents on water, the Vatican has really expressed much concern about and very strong language about corruption on all levels of scale. And so these four features, I think, are things that not only has the Pope spoken about morally and theologically even, but also that people in the United States and around the world can really latch onto as language that illuminates some of the challenges of our time. Thanks, Christiana, that's, that's excellent. I want to return to a couple of your points, but quick to Father Augusto, um, you're head of the Vatican's um, you know, pandemic tax task force and you've been um, very involved in commenting on, on the world amid this uh, COVID-19 crisis. Um, is, how is the pandemic, how, in, in the first place, how is it changing our world? What, is the, what are the opportunities? We see this in terms of a total crisis, death, suffering. Is there some way that this could work to this awakening, that this could uh, bring something good out of the suffering, that there could be a, a portal to, to, to real change? What do you see? Hey, thank you, David. Um, the answer is straightforward, yes. <laughs> the, the pandemic is terrible. We don't have to underestimate it. There's a lot of people dying, countries and entire countries lock, in lockdown, companies going bankrupt, millions of people losing their jobs. And, um, and we still don't know what's going to happen in the future. So a lot of uncertainty and pain. So we don't have to underestimate that. But having said that, uh, and in relation to, to the big crisis, to the auto sea, there's a lot of room for improvement. For example, the, the coronavirus crisis and the climate change crisis and linked with the auto sea, they have some similarities or analogies, no? That there's an analogy, there's always more dissimilarities than similarities. But let us, take, let us take how it starts. It starts with physical damage. Uh, but then it, it interconnects with social damage and and uh, and all sorts of crises. So if you if you talk about this is the famous intercon everything is interconnected or the integral ecology. No? But the in the coronavirus crisis is similar. We, the first thing that the Pope told us is this is not just a health crisis, <laughs> uh, and this was in February. This is going to be a social economic crisis and a political crisis and a faith crisis. And, 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 it's, and that's quite similar to the ecological one. The difference being that the ecological is, is, is even greater and, and bigger. <laughs> we cannot see it, uh, see it yet, but it's similar. No? Everything is, is a comprehensive crisis and therefore it's a complex one. And there's no single answer. That's why they, uh, there's no techno fix. Uh, no, but, but not just on technology. The techno fix, as Monsignor Dufe was saying, is our mentality. No? There's no single answer, not even with a, with a company, with a country, uh, and you, as you can see, the most powerful countries in the world, uh, they cannot cope uh, with, a, with the health, uh, public health systems or public and private combined, such as the US or uh, Europe. So this is very important because this is the same for the ecological crisis. There's no one that can cope and that can address this crisis, uh, and, and, and we need everybody on board, and affects everybody, so everybody has to be part. So the, uh, and the same happens with COVID. 
So that's a phrase that we used to say, the, the crisis won't get over till one person is, is infected. If it's still one person is infected, we will still be in trouble. So, well, we can say the same with other things analogically with the, with the climate crisis. So this is important to connect it. The good news, and, and also the, another analogy is that the more we wait to respond to the crisis, the more costly it is economically, the more costly it is socially, and the more costly is in terms of the damage and the, and, the, and the possibility of reaching tipping points, and therefore it will be impossible to turn over. No? Okay, the, the nature will adapt, but we, it will be very, very difficult. The same happens in a pandemic. If you, don't, if you address it too late, many people die and, and you don't know how to, how to finish it. Uh, so there's no individual or, or uh, approach or techno fix. The more you wait, the more costly it is and the worse. And, every, and it starts with physical damage, but it's, it, it gets all over. So this is the analogy, but the good news and the, and in terms of what we have heard for, for, five, de for five years, both in response to the auto C and to the sustainable development goals, is this phrase, I don't know if you have, I'm sure you have been listening to this, is we have to be realistic. No? We have to be realistic. Oh yes, particularly in the US. I, 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 every time I go to the US, I receive this phrase. No? Well, guess what? The, the pandemic, even if it is terrible, has showed that being realistic means we can make changes. Changes are possible. Uh, and it changes as big as closing entire countries. Even, even knowing that the, the entire economy will, will, will drop and will, no? Because when there is political will and when the support of people, politicians or decision makers can take radical decisions. But there has to be both. So, and this is what, what's happening in some countries at the moment that in Latin America that they don't know how long they could keep the lockdown because people are, are starting to be a bit fed up due to corruption and due to uh, social desperation. No? Uh, so, but there, when there's political will, changes are possible. And also personally, some people, particularly in the North or in, in the wealthy parts of the world, they have discovered that they don't need uh, this consumerist approach to, to thrive in their lives. They have rediscovered our, uh, the, the essence of life again. So there is, it has shows us that personally and socially there is, there is a possible change. But most importantly, I would say it has shown us that the, the COVID has exasperated all our, our social weaknesses, or this, structurally speaking, a particular inequality. No? And we say we are all in the same, in the same storm, but we are not, we're not in the same boat. It's not true. And, and, and this is in all, I mean, from medical access, healthcare, I mean, uh, debt, no, the, the, et cetera. The, the US, the Federal Reserve can, can just print money and, and you can rescue many people that you want. But other countries cannot do that. And they have to indebt themselves to do it. So even, even from that perspective, everything is more and more unequal. So, uh, and, uh, and the ecological crisis is the same. It's the same. Thing, the, the, we know that. The ecologically speaking, this is affecting for the, the very poor, even though they are contributing the least <laughs> to the to the to the to the problem. Uh, an example, the clear example is water, as as uh, Christiana puts puts her beautifully in, in, in her book too. No, so this is these are the connections, but the possibilities. Change is possible, but we need both the political will, people, and the the people support, and this is why. Um, I would say faith is important. If I may, going back to La Dottosi, my last comment will be, I think that La Dottosi has had a massive support outside the church. I've never seen a document. I, try, I have the, the, the chance to, to travel all around the world um, in, doing La Dottosi workshops. I've never seen this, never in my life, a response like this. But inside the church, there is a, but it's all about misunderstanding. And I would say three misunderstandings. One, I would say the misunderstanding of the methodology of, and this, we are all theologians here, but the misunderstanding of, of the methodology of social, social ethics. So we try to apply the methodology of dogmatic ethics no? or, do, or dogmatic theology. And we, we forget that in social ethics, we need to start with the reality. And that's why we need to start with the listening, with science, and then we, we enlighten it with our, with our theological faith. 
this, it sounds obvious to you, I'm sure, but believe me, even in the vertical, people don't understand it. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, so they, they want to start with crypto. I said, but you, have you not seen that Laudato Si doesn't start with crypto, it starts with an analysis of what's going on, and then crypto comes in. No? This is very, very important because this is also the way it is being taught in catechesis to ordinary people and to young and to, and to the, our children. So this is a first misunderstanding. The second misunderstanding is about the, the book of Genesis. You know, what does it mean to that God ha has created human beings in his image and his likeness, men and women, to dominate the earth? What does it mean that? And this is linked with what Monsignor Dupe was saying. The domination, you know, well, it's, it's true that theologically speaking, that verb means to walk over. But in the context of the, of the first story of creation, it means to dominate as God, which is a, a God that has created all things to, so that they can thrive. No, that they can be full of life. So this is, a, a, and then the connection between the first chapters of, of, of the book of Genesis, no? not only the, as Monsignor was saying, the, the production and the, and the tilling, but the caring, but also then the need to, 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 to cope with it together. No? So this is important, I would say, again, it sounds, for us, it sounds ABC for a theologian, <laughs> but believe me, there's a lot of misunderstanding of that. And this is, applies to the notion of what even Catholics are saying, even in the U.S. No, God has entrusted me to be no, an entrepreneur, and I'm, I'm taking part of God's creation. Yes, but how? Being an entrepreneur doesn't mean to, be, to act in the, in the likeness of God just per se. No? So this is, this is a ver what does it mean growth? What does it mean success? I think there's a lot of misunderstanding of that. And finally, I would say... A and means of Leo was saying, the, the, where is human beings? What is our, our role in the ecosystem? Where's our position in that? I was, I'm, we, we were in a meeting with Monsignor Dufe yesterday, I wouldn't say where, and even a, a, a Monsignor was saying, no, we have to, the most important thing is that human beings are at the center. Well, what does it mean? This, the autopsy warns us about the excessive anthropocentrism, etc. I think this is one of the main problems that we have in the Catholic Church, the anthropocentrism, uh, uh, or all the anthropocentrism that is misunderstood as opposed to, to the cosmo, cosmological approach to, to creation and to theology. And this is in the last part of the autopsy, where the Pope takes the whole understanding of the Trinity to explain this and our spirituality. Why I'm saying this? Because if we, if we, if we believe that we are the center of the world, there's no way that a person, uh, based on the Christian faith, will, under will understand the message of the autopsy. There's no way. Because they would say, well, we, have, we are first. And what the Pope is saying is, no, 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 we are part of the ecosystem. And all our, and that's why he said, see, that's why the, the, the scene in the autopsy, I agree with, uh, with Christiana, is basically focused on the scene against creation. No? So, uh, then I, w I took part of the synod, so <laughs> we have developed a little bit more that <laughs> because there was a, a push for the uh, bishops of the, of the Amazon to say, we have to say that this is a sin. Have you heard, they were saying, have you heard any people confessing themselves for an ecological sin? No. Well, we have to include this. And this is what the Kedidia Amazonia wants. But, but going back to the point, if you think, if you really think in your mind that you're the center of the earth, and that we can have to come to, we need to come first. There's no way that we can care for creation. Whereas if we really conceive ourselves as part of the ecosystem, an important part, perhaps because we are, that means that we are more responsible of other species. But other species talks, says, other species, they say something about God. And if we kill them and we destroy them, the future generations will never ever listen to that voice from God. These things, I. I haven't heard any catechist saying that to, to children or a priest in a homily. And because this misunderstanding, that then there's a resistance. And when the Pope talks, they say, well, this is the, the green Pope. And it's not true because Pope, this, I mean, John Paul II has said this before, no? But the people think that this is very, very new for the Pope. And in this case, what the Pope is, is only doing is pushing a little bit and applying to the new situation that if we don't get the driver of change, we won't change because of a flip chart or because of the UN tells us. We will change because of our deep values. And this is the, what the end of the autopsy 
is very important. Faith, spirituality, and education should be the drivers for sustainable change because can, we cannot change in an overnight. And that's why it makes us more responsible for dealing with ecological crisis, not just that is, this is part of a faith. We are even more responsible because we can provide a driver for change and we can share it with others. So this is what coronavirus and the, and the, and the, and the see are together and, and, and it's a good news, I, I, I think. Uh, Christiana, you, you raised your hand. Did you want to say something? I wish we could have this conversation for hours. This is wonderful. It's a delight to, to learn from and with you all. We can go over time as well, yes. <laughs> I know Father Jaffe or, has or, been, or a part two. Um, yeah, I, I, Augusto, these are lovely reflections, the, the three errors that you articulate, and I can't wait to teach them as, as such in my classes for promoting conversation. And it strikes me that so much of what's going on in Chapter 6 of Laudato Si has been a focus of many groups, whether women religious or congregations or schools in the United States and elsewhere, that are thinking about ecological education, that are thinking of what it means to be parts, yes, morally significant parts of a greater connected whole, and that are also thinking about sacramental worldviews and what it is to view creation in a sacramental sense, which is part of the invitation, the cosmological and sacramental perspective, certainly in chapter six, but elsewhere in the encyclical. And I would just note that the partners in conversation and faith in the uh, Orthodox Church, particularly Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, and his longstanding joint statements with John Paul II, uh, joint actions and messages on the World Day of Prayer for Creation with Pope Francis, there, there has been some mutual dialogue and information and perspective sharing, I think, on the sacramental potential of creation and how that links to a recognition that sins can be committed against something that is, in the language of orthodoxy, an icon of God. And so what it is to reach into Catholic tradition and see those kinds of parallels and resources and couple that then with language of structural sin and systems of domination is is very very powerful. Um, I want to and I want to pick up on that what you're saying and 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 Father Augusto as well. The you know there's this this is a papal encyclical and I've read a lot of papal encyclicals over the years and um, you know they don't the, the first I would say people should read it. It's it's really powerful and and. We all know this, those of us who have read it. This is a very accessible document. Not all papal encyclicals are that way. <laughs> and they're often, again, it's you know, moral theology, things that ordinary people don't engage with. I, I am struck by um, you know, the resonance, as, as Father Russo said, in the, in, the, in the wider world that this one has had. The Guardian newspaper calling it says, no other spiritual leader is speaking out so clearly for the poor and the environment. Um, and, and the Vatican, uh, Father Dufay seems very intentional on ask, you know, having other allies, not secular people, non-Catholic, obviously, but it is still very much framed in the language of sin and of, uh, and of morality and that kind of thing. Um, is that intentional? Is this, is this a real, uh, intention to reach out this isn't just for catholics to reach out to other people of goodwill uh with this kind bringing them into this kind of religious language theological language or is it something people even in the secular world simply respond to hmm. happy for any of you to, to answer that father dufe we haven't heard from you yeah just just to say that uh Perhaps we could introduce in this moment of our conversation what the Pope Francis says about the culture of encounter. What does it mean? Uh, we, we discovered that uh, we need uh, to uh, listen to the, the, the history and the experience and the memory of everybody, not only to open our mind, yes, to open our mind, but also to revisit our memory, our memory. So we, we, we need to uh, develop this dialogue between memories and dialogue between experiences. And not only to, 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 to think that we have the model, we have uh, the, 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 the even proposition, even proposals for, for the future. 
we need to uh, um, we need to listen to the story of everybody and the story uh, of a community. I, I say that because it's clear that the, the, the future of integral ecology and the future of social uh, peace and social uh, life, uh, this uh, future, this uh, becoming begins with the uh, capacity of dialogue. And it is another term, uh, very important uh, argument in the, the encyclica. We need uh, to, uh, to propose, to support, and uh, to emphasize the, the dialogue between generations, but between actors and between knowledges, between approaches of uh, the reality. But it's not so easy to, to, to have a dialogue. The, the Pope Benedict XVI uh, said, uh, it's a very, very beautiful uh, reflection. Dialogue is dia logos, the logos between us. The logos is not uh, uh, the property of a, of a group, of a church, of a, a, a community. The, the, the logos, the, the capacity to discern, the capacity to find the way uh, to develop uh, our uh, relationship with nature and with all the elements and with all the uh, the, the being uh, living being this this logos is between us and the logos is the capacity is in the capacity to exchange and to dialogue and to to have this uh, uh, possibility to to be rich together rich with our experience with our memory reach to uh, uh, consent uh, for this moment to uh, build uh, a, 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 a way together, to, 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 to build a future together. So I think it's very important to say that in front of growing of inequality, because inequality is not only an economic tema and an, an economic issue, but it's also a uh, psychological, psychological, and philosophical, and political uh, issue. We need to uh, propose uh, another uh, way to pass from inequality to rediscover the talents, the, rediscover the, the capacity, the capabilities of the others. And uh, this is a, a way, this is an application uh, to pass from individualism, individualism uh, as a system, as a, a common good system, common good system. We have to, to, uh, to, to think about this question of common. How can we develop the common? The common good is not only to build community, but to open our community, our human community to the future, uh, to the future of life. And I think we, we, we have to, to, to link, it's a very theological uh, a program, to link the, the capacity to, 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 to gather and to share our capacity, our production, our uh, uh, innovation, innovation, and to uh, open this, this uh, experience of uh, gathering and uh, expressing our experience to uh, something like a, 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 an horizon, a, a, um, how to say that, a hope, not only hope, but uh, a, a capacity to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, build a new, a new way to be together, to be together, yeah, I think. Um, and per yeah. perhaps it's the, the meaning of the communion. Communion yeah. is not only, uh, yes, it's a symbolic, symbolic act. But it's also a social act and a political act. Communion is to be together, and when somebody is not is not with us, uh, we need we, we miss this this person. That that the the the, the, the anthropological uh, debate uh, between holistic society and the individualist society. In the holistic society and in the holistic vision. Everybody is important. 
every uh, uh, each each being is important and when we we have we, we, we miss somebody this this person missed miss uh, so we we are in in this in this interaction between uh, the person person and community and I think it's very important to link the question of integral ecology uh, harmony new harmony with uh, with all the the, 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 the being the, the question of solidarity and this question of communion and uh, uh, common good Leo did you want to say something yeah um Father Jaffe brings in a lot of uh, really important points about um, communion and sacramentality, building off of the prior discussion. You know, at the back of all this, uh, this document, yes, it's for, um, for the world as a whole, for all people, people of goodwill, but primarily the primary readers are going to be Catholics or people of faith within Christianity um, who are on a hopefully regular basis going to um, think and reflect about what this means for their own faith in the everyday. And some of the major categories that, uh, that, that, that are in the document, that haunt the document and that haunt us as church is, I mean, how deeply do we conceive of the incarnation? How, how do we think of the incarnation? And then there's this, um, in section 99 of it, it talks about it. There's the presence of Christ throughout creation. Yes, in the human person, but throughout creation. That brings in notions of the Holy Spirit. How do we think of pneumatology? theology of the spirit, how is the spirit present or in what modes? It takes us back to even documents from Vatican II, uh, where is the spirit at work? Where is the spirit's work being resisted by evil? And as we think about those categories, as we think about the spirit's presence or Christ's presence, um, it brings in notions of how do we understand sacramentality? How do we contain sacramentality to ecclesial practices or two liturgical practices? How do they overflow those practices? And this is where I think we need to be very direct and explicit and bold about thinking of the broader movement of Francis and the broader movement of the church worldwide. And by church, I don't mean to start with the hierarchy, but I mean the people, especially at the margins, and particularly the indigenous communities. And particularly when we start thinking about the Amazon Synod or uh, last summer, I was in Peru um, at a theological kind of gathering with indigenous communities and hearing some of the cosmological views, I said, wow, this is so different. And I don't know how to necessarily reconcile those, but we are of the same faith. We were there and they were Christian, they were Roman Catholic. And I thought, huh, we need, we are just at the beginning, perhaps, as a world church community, if we can even speak of a world community that's not as Eurocentric, we're just at the beginning of trying to understand the grammars of how the spirit is at work, of how Christ is at work at the margins. And that requires really rethinking theology. I know this is maybe less on the practical side of Laudato Si, but Laudato Si is built on solid theological grounding of scripture and uh, the book of nature and Christology and I said a bit of pneumatology, but as Francis really brings indigenous voices to the forefront when he goes to San Cristóbal de las Casas, when he goes to other parts of the world and, and, and also brings them to the Vatican. And when we see examples of colonial violence continuing to take place, yes, they were just wooden images thrown into the river for some, for others not. We have to take seriously that these are moments of revelation of how deep the what we called earlier the technocratic logic the sickness of modernity how deep it goes and how deeply difficult it's going to be to address these issues and indigenous lives and lives of people of color and the lives of the poor etc etc if we don't change those logics and we can't change the logic without also expanding our theological frameworks for those logics and that takes a lot of people that takes the church worldwide and a lot of listening in a sacramental mode I want to bring up a couple of points, especially as I'm reflecting some of our many great questions, um, trying to synthesize some of them. One is pro-life and the other one is racism. A lot of Americans, particularly thinking about voting and pro-life is associated with uh, anti-abortion here. Can, should Catholics and American Catholics as they vote be also taking into account climate change, Laudato Si, in the pro-life context? Um, whoever wants to take a little uh, Christiana uh, it, or Augusto, but it's, you know, is this, can this be seen as, a, should this be seen as a pro-life issue as well? 
Absolutely. I think that some of the most compelling lines that I enjoy talking about and writing about are that uh, access to fresh water, for example, is a fundamental human right and indeed a fundamental right to life issue because it is the condition for the fulfillment of all other human rights. So it is false to regard questions of life, flourishing, dignity, and sanctity of life as being only relegated to what we might call reproductive or pelvic issues. And even the expansion to questions of euthanasia, to questions of death penalty, also vital. But I'm struck by Father Augusto's comment that the pandemics that beset us in the form of climate change, in the form of COVID-19 as a global viral pandemic, will not be solved. The dignity of humanity will, will not be able to uh, open itself to a future of flourishing when even one person is affected by those. And I think that is the kind of logic that is at best at the heart of the church's pro-life logic. Um, in the United States, of course, we tend to have a very, dare I say, pelvic focus on things um, with regard to sexuality and reproduction and life issues. And that is a very narrow way of voting. Um, it is a way of voting that selectively ignores much of the Catholic Church's teaching. Anybody else want to weigh in? Father Augusto, I, I, did, I also wanted to raise the issue which a number of people are raising, is the issue of racism and ecological racism and the, and the, the inequalities this raises. Is this, again, this is something that is so traumatic to us in the United States in these days. Is there something that, um, that the Pope speaks to uh, in this regard that we should be taking note of in these days? Um, well, sure. He has he has said that there's no room for for racism and, and, and for any kind of discrimination. But no, um, at least from from our faith perspective, just to start up theological the theological basis being that have been created in the image of God and every single person. And we uh, and and this is what makes our our. A notion of human dignity or human or human rights so strong, no? because there's no room for discrimination, or there shouldn't be. Um, but but taking, I mean, I'm trying to link that point, if I may, um, with about this is something about life. I mean, all of us is something about life, um, and you cannot. I mean, of course, we need to protect the life, especially the life of the most vulnerable. That's why what the pro-life movements are, are about. I, I, I think. Uh, but also, what about the, the ones, ones? What about the babies who were just born, and they are in a migration camp? What about what about the people who don't have access to uh, fresh water in the U.S. That is the richest country in the world, and because they don't have access to fresh water, they have enormous problems of health. But they don't have access to public health systems also, and they died, and they died for for reasons that. A person living in New York or DC or LA, they, 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 it would be unthinkable of. I mean, what about them? Or what about the people who die because they cannot raise the crops in Africa? They, the only thing that they, they, they for generations and generations, they, they, they needed to, they, what well, they learned, and now they can because the climate is so, so disruptive that they, they and then, and therefore they migrate because they, what are they going to do? They, till the climate sorts out. So, what, what about? The people in the Philippines who have died and die and continue dying from from the tsunamis, and what about the millions of people who they're in in every year there are more than seven million dying for food issues every year. That's more than coronavirus, malaria, and all the diseases combined. What about that? That is not that life. Oh, well, no, and, and many people are from minorities, of course. I don't know if you call it racism in the U.S., but it could be other, any other minority. It could be the indigenous people in in Brazil any other minority. So what I think is what the Pope put the fingers in, and that's may, maybe it's worth raising the issue, is that the message of Laudato Si and the message also that he's putting across in the, during the COVID time is a message that challenges our own ideologies. Our ide ideologies is when you have an idol that, that positions himself or herself in the place of God. So our ideology could be a good thing, could be our understanding of economic growth, but that's not God. Or could be even a, 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 our understanding of, of a movement, but that's not God. The movement is a part of, no? Or could be 
it could be even our own religion. Our own religion can be ideological. If we, if in the name of God we we are killing people, no, or we are allowing people to be killed. So, but what the Pope is challenging is that because the, let's be honest, the major resistance from Laudato Si and from a common good solution for the COVID pandemic comes from the people that are in power, or in power meaning with that are better off. In case of the of the of the Laudato Si, it comes from the from the from the lobby of the fossil fuel industries. No, it comes now. How can you explain that in a time of pandemic, instead of investing millions of dollars in public health, the most powerful countries in the world, including yours, are investing in nuclear weapons? How can how can how on earth can you can you understand? Why do you want a nuclear weapon if we are dying for a virus that we could not we cannot? I mean, it's it's so you see this is what we call systemic change. So I'm not saying I'm I'm not entering into the discussion of weapons, but I'm saying when your object becomes idol, whether that's money, whether that's power, whether that's domination, whether that's a, I don't, a race domination, or a, that's that's an idol. And Francis talks a lot about idols. I don't know if you if you heard, and I don't know about ideology. And we are not excluded from that because the first ideologies are normally coming from ourselves when we put at the center something that is not God. As we we, for example, human beings, we are not God, so we are not at the center. The center should always be God. So. So this is very important. For example, I will tell you a concrete example in terms of um, of Laudato Si and the pandemic combined that we, I mentioned before: the corruption. No? Can we have a, 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 can we have a healthy society with corruption? No. And therefore, can we have a, a can we have a healthy system, a healthy public health system, and, and people healthy people with, with when conduction, con, corruption is endemic? No. So therefore, this is what we need to change: the, the system that generates corruption and, and prevents us from being healthy. Without healthy people, there's no healthy institutions, there's no healthy planet. We need to combine them and integrate them. But for that, we need to, unfortunately, we need to tackle our but sometimes the others as well. And this is this is a message that, instead of accusing each other. It helps us. We all need a spiritual conversion, an ecological conversion. That's one of the central messages that I to see. We are all walking together in, in this path of spiritual conversion. If you don't conceive yourself in that path, you should question if you understand how to see. Christiana, I if, wanted to put that to you. Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you, David. If indeed everything is connected, which it is morally in this document, and as we are seeing in the present day, I think we need to double down on what some of the questioners have rightly raised about racism, and especially in the United States, but not only. Racism and colonialism in their many forms and their many legacies. In a document released by the Vatican that was on water, but that touched on many things, um, paragraph 81 talks about how the Catholic Church ought always to live according to the preferential option for the poor, that is, when pertinent, not to limit itself to being a neutral mediator, but to take sides with those who suffer most, with those who are most in difficulty, with those who have no voice and see their rights trampled or their efforts frustrated, end quote. One of the upshots of Father Zampini's comment that with social ethics, we begin where we are with what is going on on the ground is that in the United States and also around the world, problems of racism are very real very entrenched and what is seen as neutral theology or neutral environmentalism or obvious and objective has been conditioned by a legacy of people in certain positions of power with certain historical political and racialized worldviews uh, claiming a kind of universality that is false and so the imperative is on white catholics is on leadership in the catholic church priests orders of women religious, the USCCB, and others to be actively anti-racist and co to connect that to all sorts of degradations of values of life when it comes to the environment, of values of life when it comes to the death penalty and incarceration and a range of other issues. And so with the welling up, the revelation of what has always been here, which is a legacy of racism, a legacy of colonialism, it is in fact a negation of moral responsibility for our leaders in the church as for our leaders in politics not to address that and to say what is being revealed what is being seen about the truth of reality and who is suffering 
and what would it mean to stand with those who are oppressed? For those of you who have asked, because I'm a professor, I will give you a, a reference. James Cone, a Black American Protestant liberation theologian, has a lovely essay from the year 2000 called Whose Earth Is It Anyway? It is something that those of us who are scholars of or speak from and about the Catholic Church could learn a great deal from. So thank you to those who have raised those questions. And just to pick up on that issue of what the church can do, um, increasingly we've seen religious orders uh, do, doing socially responsible investing, the, the Vatican itself, I believe, divesting from fossil fuels, solar energy. Um, are these important things for the church to do, to lead on in, in these concrete steps and not just to preach, you know, not just to issue encyclicals, but also to be leading in terms of action? Yeah, Leo. I think, yeah. I'm sorry. I mean, I'll just say my, my personal perspective on this. Certainly it's important. Um, it's important, important to model those kinds of actions. None of that necessarily goes to the very structure of that paradigm that we keep coming back and that it's at the core of the document though. That requires a whole rethinking. And again, if we're going to rethink the world as a whole in one sense, we start at the margins. We start with those communities with their conceptions of what a good life may look like. Um, and I'll just bring in a tiny example of just the, the small ways that this can happen at the at the margins and not with those who have lots and lots of money to invest or they invest from. Tenosique in Mexico, Los 72 is a shelter um, for people on the move, Central Americans on their way north to the United States. So they're you know seeking refuge, they're migrants. And because of La Dato C in 2017, they started a farm. And so the people that stay at the refugio, La 72, work at the farm, learn about environmental concerns, learn about Laudato Si, feed their fellow migrants on the road until they themselves are on the road, either deported back to Central America because they did not get uh, status in Mexico or going further north, try, trying at the US. This is a very minor example, of course, that does not in any way compare perhaps to the effects of what can happen with millions of dollars. And yet I think the logics that are embedded into those um, witnesses at the margins is exactly the kind of logics that are going to, if there's hope for a new modernity, a different modern, different way of being human in this world, we have to really pay attention and listen, which is something so emphasized in this document, receptivity, the ability to listen, as Berta Cáceres would say, to the rivers flowing and what they are saying. Beautiful, Leo. Just one, I want to respect our time. We've already gone over a few minutes. One final question to each of you, just to get your sense. There are a lot of people who are feeling very down, very discouraged, very pessimistic, frankly. Is, you know, is it too late? You know, we see the ice caps melting. We see just environmental degradation. We see the pandemic, no vaccine on the horizon for a year, maybe. We may be doing this virtual conversations as wonderful as they are for a while. Um, is it too late? Is there reason for either optimism or hope? Father Dufay. I would like to say that uh, I'm not, I, I don't agree uh, it's too late. And uh, I would like to say that this uh, uh, way to present the, the, the challenges is not a good way. Because uh, we 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 have too many things to 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 promote. <laughs> uh, we have too many things to to encourage, uh, to uh, uh, realize. Uh, listening to the to the to the uh, people looking for a new spirituality, uh, a new way of life, uh, and I think the the. the most important challenge for, for us in the in the church and the, the Christianity is to propose and to offer a reconciliation between uh, a religious uh, Christianity and the social Christianity and ecological Christianity. We we have to to try to uh, to, to 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 have a, a meeting between between us, and it's time it's time to 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 propose that. Uh, it's it's not. The apocalyptic, the catastrophic, catastrophic uh, purpose uh, is just like a, 
uh, I don't know how, how to say, it's just to, uh, to discourage and not to encourage. So wh wh what does it mean, too late? To, to, today is, uh, uh, the, 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 the word after is the word today. So I, I think that uh, when the, the, the uh, actors, social actors and Christian and Christian actors at the end of the 19th century uh, uh, was fighting for the human rights, for so the social rights in, in the factories, uh, uh, demanding a contract, a right to, to have a contract, a, 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 a right to have a time to rest, a, a, a right to have money uh, to, to survive. It, it was not too late. It, it, it was the, the challenge of the, of, the, of the first industrial revolution. We are in front of a new revolution, the ecological revolution, which is also uh, uh, ecological conversion. So we, it's not too late to, to, to have this revolution, but we, we, uh, we, uh, it's, it's, it's urgent to, to have this revolution. It's not too late uh, to, to have this conversion, but we, we have to, to, to offer our time and our capacities uh, to uh, uh, meet people uh, in, in this way of, uh, of uh, conversion. So I, I think that we, we have to, to offer the, the, the possibilities for, for tomorrow and uh, not to uh, stay on principle. We, we, we could have a very beautiful uh, purpose about dignity, but dignity without human rights is nothing. We could have a, a very uh, good uh, purpose about subsidiarity and responsibility, but the experience of responsibility is more important than the concept of responsibility. We could have a, a proposition, proposals in politics plan, but to, to participate to the, to, the, to, the, to the political life and to have citizen debate is more important. So the question I think is to, to reconciliate, to, to have a different conciliation between ideas and realities, and perhaps to uh, participate to this education, uh, this uh, uh, accompaniment of people uh, to law and to human rights. And I think it's more important that the, 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 the purpose about the catastrophism and the, the, the end of the world. We, we uh, I think to believe is to hope and, uh, and to, to believe is to be actors. Uh, so that, that's my, my, my reflection about that. Thank you. Any others of you, a final word? How do you, Father Augusto? Thank you. Uh, thank you, David, and thank you, everyone, also. Um, it's never too late to, to start the process of change. You cannot change in, a, in, a, in an overnight. Or, and, and it's never too late to start with something small. People normally disconnect, it's, it's, it's too overwhelming to you. Mm -hmm. And that's why Laudato Si mentions the centuries of Lisier, where every single gesture of love counts. So every single person can start doing something. Now, we know that that something is not enough, but we, it's not too late to start doing something and, and to start creating this contagious you know, com conversion towards something different. But at the same time, we need political intervention, we need systemic change. Uh, be, uh, because individual and communal conversion is not enough. Uh, and, and for that, we need to be aware. It's not too late, yes, or, or I would say not yet. <laughs> but we need to be aware of the tipping points uh, that, that I was mentioning. The tipping points were really at the center of the scene of the Amazon, because if the, for example, for people you to understand, the Amazon, if we continue exploiting the Amazon as we do, in in 10 years' time, it won't be the Amazon any longer. So the, the nature will adapt, but it won't be the Amazon. It will be a different thing. And therefore, that, that like a heart, ecological heart of the planet won't have the functions that it has now in terms of the ecosystem. An example, the world will continue. The problem is we will, we will struggle because the world will be different. So we need to be careful because we don't want to enter into those tipping points that it will be terrible for humanity. There's no... If, we, if there's a certain level of temperature rise that if we reach them, we know that no sapiens have ever lived in that world. Well, I'm sure people could live that, but it will be a completely different world. Uh, so 
we want to, and, and the last thing is more than than terrible things or 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 predicting is what do you want to be remembered for because i don't want to be remembered we will I, I tell you what we will be remembered as the most irresponsible generation ever in the history of human beings now i don't want to be remembered like that why <laughs> so i want to be remembered as something that that gave everything that he could to prevent that from happening because I don't want to leave to my nephews and nieces a, a worse world and a truly worse world socially and naturally that I, than the one I inherited. I don't want to take part of that. I want to take part of the opposite. I want to be part, I want to be remembered as, a, as part of a movement that we, we, we work and we fight and we, we, we intervene in politics and, and change personal lives so that we can transfer to the next generations well, a world where they can still live and they can thrive. So this is the question. It's not just about responsibilities. What do you want to be remembered for? Because believe me, I truly don't want to be remembered as being part of the most irresponsible generation ever. I want to be remembered as something that we saw the problem, we understood it, and thanks to the be part, being part of the Catholic Church, we were able to generate a massive movement of conversion that enables to do justice. And for that, uh, the Pope wants that next year we will have a seven-year jubilee plan of all conversions, all plans for action with examples of how to do it in the next five years. The next, the next seven years, we really need to change. Uh, forget about if it will be too late or not. We, we know that we have to change. This is the time, and, uh, and, and this is time for this is an opportunity for us to be a responsible uh, generation. Thank you. Uh, Leo or uh, Christiana, hope or apocalypticism? Uh, hope, certainly hope. And I would say uh, I find hope when we as church look to social movements as the movements that we pair up with, that we buttress, that we support. The church does not have to be the avant-garde. It can be the rear guard, the one that protects from behind, the one that does the the negotiations that does the um, translation of ideas from a religious framework to a secular framework and, and in reverse, I really do believe from an ecclesiological perspective, where do we find the Holy Spirit at work? Social movements. And it's no accident that Pope Francis brings so much good attention to social movements. The spirit is at work there, I would say, as a Catholic. And my task, our task as parishes, I would say, I'll bring it to that level, is not to start a whole new program from scratch with the mission statement and so forth. Let's pair up and put our resources as church with this uh, uh, movement that's already off the ground, that's actually got great vision um, that we can support. Be the rear guard, not the avant garde. Uh, I think we'll be in good company for the future. Well, thank you all. I, this is, you've given me hope. I'm less apocalyptic than I was this morning before this conversation, um, if not quite optimistic, but very hopeful. It's a wonderful vision you've all given to us. Thank you all for taking part of, in this, and we look forward to you joining us again for another conversation.